I'm so excited to have you uh, with us today, Greg, because you're at the forefront of some really exciting things. Um, and we'll get into a lot of that. Um, but for those who may not necessarily be uh, familiar with you and Pineapple Academy, can you kind of give us a, a broad overview of what your journey has been like sure. and why you decided it was important for you to start Pineapple Academy? Sure. Happy to. Thank you for asking. It's great to be here with you, Adam. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so, you know, um, I, I guess I really have to start at the beginning, you know, uh, I was a Johnson Wales grad. Uh, I got into food and beverage, you know, through that route, uh, got into hotels and resorts and, and did a lot of food service management stuff, type stuff. Um, I even did a little stint as a chef instructor in the early 90s where I really learned how to deliver curriculum and, and structure classes and, and train people. Um, and so, and, and what's beautiful about that is, you know, most of your audience is in, in that 18 to 22 year range. So you really understand how to connect with younger people and, and, mm -hmm. and what they need to learn. So, so over the years, I've really learned how to interact with, with folks on a training. I've run many training programs, mm -hmm. uh, either as a consultant or as an operator, because I've just always been a training guy. It's like, mm -hmm. It's just so important to understand what you're doing. <laughs> and, and so <laughs> I, yeah, I know that I know it's not kind of captain obvious, but unfortunately we've all been to enough restaurants to know that that isn't necessarily what's happening in the real world uh, all the time. Uh, right. And I, I think most of us also have the experience of like being tossed a set of keys at the end of the night and said, okay, it's up to you to close the joint down. And you've right. never been trained to do any of that. Right. <laughs> Best story I've heard recently. Uh, a guy that works with us, a uh, wonderful person when he was in high school, he was uh, 15 years old and he was working in a restaurant and, and he was completely knows nothing about anything. And the chef goes, Hey, I need you to clean and get the shrimp ready for tonight mm -hmm. and hands him a block. You know, those, remember the frozen 10 pound blocks of, of shrimp, you know, yeah. used to come in. Right. And they get, you know, and they have to be, you know, peel and the vein, all that kind of stuff, manual stuff. He was in a frozen block. The kid, I mean, he's 15 years old. He has no idea. You know what he did? He throws it in the sink, turns on the hot water, uh -huh. and suddenly all the shrimp's pink. <laughs> and now, and so now the chef comes by and the chef goes, the hell are you doing? And it's like, what he's doing is exactly what he thinks he needs to do because he doesn't know anything. And you right. ask a guy to prep an expensive product and, and he has, knows nothing about it. But anyway, I digress. But these are the kind of things that happen on, on a regular basis around the country. So, so basically, what my journey is, you know, I've been in hotels and resorts. Uh, I've done some restaurant work. Uh, I've done some franchise work. Um, and, and, and again, you just see the same problems over and over with what's going on. And then in 2008, um, I, I had really gotten in for several years. I'd really gotten into the development side of things. Um, I was like an owner's rep. Uh, I would represent, you know, high net worth people who had investments and, and, and this one particular man I was working for uh, out of Charleston, South Carolina, he had some land um, in uh, a town called Brevard, North Carolina, up in the up in the mountains, gorgeous mountain mm -hmm. town. And um, and he wanted to put a hotel there with a restaurant. So I came. Here's Greg. So I've got this lot of land. It's right in the downtown area and I've got architects and designers, and all this thing. So we've worked for a year and a half, almost two years, you know, designing this thing. And uh, literally, I, cause I was the liaison with the county and the town. And, and so I literally go in, I end up finally pulling the permit so we can break around and start this project, super excited. Um, and uh, what happens is we have the 2008 crash. Right. So anybody of you out there who was involved in restaurants and hotels back in 08, uh, we remember the heartburn that occurred at that moment, particularly yep. those of us in the development game, uh, zero money yep. and everything dries up. And so literally the permit meant nothing at that point. Um, had a piece of dirt and a permit and, and it wasn't going to go anywhere. So I started looking at, at my career and, and what really kind of lit me up. And, and I realized that the truth of the matter is I've always been a food guy. I mean, I just, I mean, that's how I grew up. I'm, a, I'm of Italian descent. 
Uh, I spent my Sundays every Sunday at my grandma's house eating amazing food and, you know, experiencing that hospitality, uh, you know, and, and just feeling that my whole life. And, and I never thought I didn't know that nobody else did that either. I, I just thought that's how everybody lives. Right. <laughs> uh, and so uh, but you, you find out later that's not always the case. So I was very fortunate the way I grew up and, and the way I was exposed to food. And so food was a joyful thing. It was camaraderie. It was family. It was friends. And that's what food has always meant to me. And so um, and so I decided to get into healthcare. And so which is kind of which is kind of funny because, you know, 35 years earlier, we were laughing at the guys that would go into hospitals. That's absolutely Am I right. right? Yep. And, and no, no disrespect to anybody at this point, because I have learned it's a very respectful environment that you need to take seriously. It yep. takes a tough operator and somebody who knows what the hell they're doing to be in healthcare. Healthcare is not for sissies. I mean, let's just put it that <laughs> way. It is. It can be a hard gig, but it's also very rewarding. And it's also, it does not have the hours that, that, you know, restaurants and hotels have. It doesn't have the late nights and the crazy weekends. It's a very different structure, but, and, and, but it's very food forward these days, you know, um, you know, the days in the number 10 cans and, and the scoop, you know, pudding out of the number 10 cans or, or the green beans, it's just not what's happening anymore. That's and correct. so, and, and I've had the pleasure of being in, in that movement. Um, over the last 15 years, you know, since 2008 to help with that transition. Mm -hmm. um, I've done a lot of projects in uh, as a consultant in hospitals, moving them from a what's called a tray line assembly to hotel style room service, That's just correct. like I ran in hotels. It, I mean, it literally is no different. Um, there's tons of catering opportunities. There's retail. I mean, what, you know, the hospital cafeterias, these are not cafeterias anymore. Um, these are, you know, like a, a business and industry accounts. These are action stations. These are, you know, I mean, granted, there's a few pockets around the country, you know, where you have the old style hospital food scenario. But for the most part, particularly in these, the urban areas, these are first class, you know, serveries and bistro, you know, type environments. And, and the food's fantastic. Um, and it's driven by chefs. And that's the other thing you've seen over the last 15 years. You've seen a lot of top end chefs come into the space. I mean, I know guys who have won huge ACF you know, awards. I know a guy right now in North Carolina who heads up um, um, uh, a healthcare system in Raleigh, North Carolina, who was voted the number one chef in North Carolina. Right. No, not a healthcare chef, just the number one chef in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. You know, a guy named Ryan Conklin. So it's sort of like, you know, he's a CIA guy, by the way. So these people have found their places in healthcare and realized there's a huge opportunity there. Um, and it's just as diverse as hospital, uh, sorry, as hotels or restaurants. Like I said, you have doctor's lounges, you have catering, you have retail, you have patient services, you have just a lot of food service opportunities, working with a foundation. I have been, I've been in, in, in foundation, hospital foundation events where we're doing in big tents, like super high end, you yep. know, fundraising events, you know, like I used to do in the hotel business. Mm -hmm. um, so, so there's a lot of things that, that are similar, uh, but the differences are very, are very clear. Um, the hours of operation, it, it's not alcohol forward type environments. Um, it's definitely a more controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And and there's obviously other layers of regulations above even the FDA food regs. There's even even tougher standards because of what you have to do to take care of patients. That's correct. The clinical side of it. So it's an interesting world. Um, I've gotten to know it very well. And then, of course, that brings in senior living. Uh, I've done a lot of projects, everything from skilled nursing to independent living. Uh, some of my clients are some of the biggest. Uh, senior living clients in the United States. I mean, their properties look like resorts. I mean, That's they're correct. gorgeous, right? Um, you know, so, you know, a friend of mine, uh, Eric Eisenberg, um, you know, incredible culinarian. He runs 
um, a, in Medford, Oregon for Pacific Retirement, just this incredible, what's called a continuing care retirement community or a lifestyle community. Um, honest to God, Adam, it, it, it you, you think you're walking into the four seasons. I mean, right. the dining rooms that are there and the opportunities there, the wine service, and they have wine rooms and, you know, mm -hmm. they're right in the middle of wine country, right? right. Uh, it's just gorgeous. So huge opportunities. Um, you know, for culinarians and food service management people who are looking to get out of the late nights and a, and a lot of the, the antics, let's face it, that, that go sure. on. Uh, and it's just a different environment. And so um, I, I think you find your blood pressure going down. I, I know mine did. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, I once you know that. what's going on, right? I spent two years in a upscale retirement community here in Asheville. And the first time I walked on property, I thought I was in a country club. Mm hmm um, and, yeah. um, it's interesting because as the general public have gotten more educated about food, they're the ones that have been driving this change. That's so all right. of a sudden the people who are turning 65 are much more different than the ones That's who might exactly be right. 70, 80 years old and have been exposed to something completely different. So it's a fascinating time to be in that particular really uh, area. There's no doubt. This is a pivotal moment in, in this industry. Uh, both senior living and hospitals and, and let's just face it food service in general because of the aging population i i don't know if people really understand the demographic shifts that are happening in this country mm. and how substantial they are um we're talking about you know just tens of thousands of people turning 65 and 75 every day mm -hmm. you're talking about in 10 years from now, the number of people over 65 in this country are going to create a, a, like this huge opportunity for people. Uh, and, and there's not going to be enough younger people to take care of all of it. And so, so where does that leave all of us as, as, as operators, as investors, you know, as customers, um, you really got to start realizing that food service for a long, long time has been very labor driven. It's very hands on type stuff. It's very, it takes a lot of, there's a lot of tasks involved. So the issue is how do we incorporate technology to reduce our FTE load and create kitchens that can put out high quality food without having to go through every single process to get the food ready. Now, granted, there's, you know, it started, I think with lettuce. I mean, we used to start, you know, what was that, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we could start buying bags of, you know, spinach and lettuce, that kind of mm -hmm. stuff, uh, ready to use RTU. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and there was nothing wrong with it. It was clean. It was nice. It was good products and they've only gotten better. I mean, my God, I mean, I have a friend that, that works for a, a lettuce company out of Massachusetts and she is, a registered dietitian and her job is to make sure is, is quality control and this product coming out is absolutely beautiful you know greens that the that these companies and it's all in controlled environments mm -hmm. you're going to see that everywhere it's going to be it's going to be fish we're already seeing all these things emerging um and so what's going to end up happening is we're going to have to start bringing in product that's already sliced and diced and ready to go. It doesn't mean that we're going to buy Stouffer's lasagna. I mean, no. don't, don't get me wrong. I, I love scratch cooking, but we all have to get real with, with what's happening with labor. It's like, right. if you, if you don't have that guy to do your P and D shrimp, then gosh, you're going to have to buy P and D shrimp, whether it's cooked or raw. That's correct. Cause you don't have it. There's nobody to do the work. Right. Um, and I so mean, we just have to get it, real about it. It's the conundrum of, uh, you know, people requiring a higher quality of food and yet not right. having the hands on deck in order to produce it. Yeah. So I remember, you know, getting uh, boxes of um, already cut mirepoix, yeah. you know, and I looked at that and I was, you know, in a previous time of my life, I would have been like, that's crazy. That's bullshit. Yeah. You I, know, I get a dishwasher over here right, with a right, knife. Right. But the reality is, is that that labor shortage exists across the entire system. So that means I probably don't have a dishwasher who's available. Right. Right. Or the kid didn't show up at all. <laughs> right. Exactly. And the more that we, right. I mean, I think it's probably started with sous vide. Um, and I, uh, 
once I started understanding more and more about what that was about, I found out that there was a restaurant in France that was basically a full sous vide restaurant, mm -hmm. which uh, consisted of, you know, a boiling pot of water and two cooks with scissors. Yet right. it was one of the most popular places because the food was always consistently great. Consistent. I tell you, sous vide is just fantastic. Um, yep. You know, I, I mean, Kaiser Permanente on the West Coast, California. I mean, all the hospitals in the greater San Francisco area, sous vide. All the proteins <laughs> are sous vide. And, and, and now you'll be able to buy sous vide products from manufacturers. You That's don't correct. even have to do it yourself. So right. you could end up, you could end up with systems, particularly if you get really digital and you really take advantage and leverage, leverage technology, you can be shrinking your labor footprint by a third, as long, as long as you understand that your food cost is going to go up. But your overall overhead is going to actually be end up being lower. You're going to have less waste. You're going to be throwing away less boxes. You're going to be doing there's the, the ripple effect of where this is all going financially just makes a lot of sense. And, and what we're seeing now is because we have partnerships with, you know, U.S. Foods and Gordon's Food Service mm -hmm. and, and other people. There is a lot of people coming into this space with prepared foods. Right. And, and uh, it's amazing. Um to pivot a little bit um, because it seems to me that one of the things that <clears throat> our industry or our craft uh, forgot along the way is, uh, you know, in the olden days, uh, you know, if you wanted to be a chef, you had to apprentice yourself to a chef and peel mm -hmm. potatoes for a year or whatever that horror story was. Right. Um, and then with the advent of for-profit uh, culinary schools in the eighties mm -hmm. uh, and them selling the pipe dream as evidenced on the food network, which was mm -hmm. coming online at the same time, um, now all of a sudden you've got a steady influx of, you know, <laughs> to the degree in which they're trained properly can be, can be argued. But the fact of the matter is, is that, you know, uh, typically folks who had been involved in the industry before going into culinary school ended up being a lot more, uh, agile than say someone who came in there. Um, but, uh, I think the industry just kind of sat back on its heels and said, great, we don't have to train anymore. And oh, so he nailed it on the head. And so that kind of went by the way that it was like, we forgot that that was job one as a chef is as, as a teacher sure. and a mentor. Um, and also, you know, as a model of a mature professionalism for these young people who are coming in and have these visions of their type of cuisine and right. what they wanted to achieve in the industry. So for me, it seemed like there was always a gap between the available workforce and the skill level that they needed to be able to do their job appropriately. And right. the question is, is like, I don't have time to train. That's right. Because everybody's at the same time got really, really tight. It seemed to me that was more the advent of the entrepreneur as opposed to the traditional uh, hotelier or hospitality professional where, right. you know, that whole idea about hospitality kind of went out the door and now it becomes a mechanical transition, uh, transaction right. between I'm preparing this, I get this and you know, you provide this in return and, and we're done and moving on. So right. when was it that you, like I read, um, uh, on your website that, um, I was founded by two friends with a common belief that enough is enough when it came to accepting <laughs> levels of turnover in the food service industry. Right. The average turnover in the food service industry is 30% higher than the average of all under all other industries. And there are some, there are, there are some systems that are now uh, achieving 150% turnover, sure. which to me is just mind boggling, which means, you know, half your staff is turning over every three months and, oh. and so course, course. If, if you right. didn't have, if you didn't have time to train before, you have probably have less time to train now. Yeah. And yet you're just barely keeping your head above the water, right. which is why I think there's a movement afoot now between some very well-known chefs who are, you know, tapping out of main street and they're like, Nope, um, I'm out of here. This is just, yeah. you know, between the shutdown and then mm -hmm. the great reopen when everybody rushed in thinking that it was business as normal. Meanwhile, we're standing in the back going, Hey, uh, you know, we lost a third of our staff and that's why we have to close down a portion of our dining room. Yep. Um, there were some folks that didn't understand that nor appreciate that, not that they needed to, but when was it apparent to you that like this whole training thing, man, has got to be something that, that we need to jump on. So about 10 years ago, um, I was sharing with you, I would go around the country doing training <laughs> programs. And so, you know, I'd actually be on site and, and work with a lot of great people, well-intentioned people. And so, um, 
you know, thank God they were there. Um, but unfortunately, what you see is what I would call the blind leading the blind leading the blind, which means you have ownership that really never got trained in hospitality and food service. Mm -hmm. You have managers in these operations who may have never worked anywhere except that location or that, that you know, that process. So their right. knowledge of food service is very limited. And then you got these employees. So there, there's no transfer of knowledge about as a subject of food service and, and really understanding what it takes right down to how to take the trash out. I mean, mm -hmm. there's technique for everything, right? Sure, and absolutely. So, and so what you see as you travel around the country and, and you're working these operations, you basically see the same situation over and over and over again. And you realize that there's no way that there's going to be enough trainers to go out there into the world to train everybody to where they need to get to. So, you know, we don't all end up with intestinal diseases because of the food we're eating in our restaurants and food service outlets. You know, yep. I mean, that's, that's kind of where it's gotten, right? Yep. And so, uh, and so you realize that the other thing you, you recognize, and, and, and it kind of came to me because I started gravitating towards, you know, YouTube, I find myself, Hey, I want to, I want to, I want to, I want to build a pergola in my backyard mm -hmm. or a fire pit or whatever. And suddenly here I am, I'm on YouTube and, and I'm a lot older than your typical tech guy. And, and I'm using, you know, using training videos to train myself. Sure. Same thing with my business partner. Um, and so suddenly we're just going, the only way to scale training is to go online. Now, granted, a lot of pe uh, a lot of purists out there are going to go, oh, Greg, you can't train people virtually. You know, you, you, if it's culinary, you got to be right there. I don't disagree. I, I, I'm not going to sit here and try to make the case that online is the only methodology to train people. <laughs> but let me tell you something. The one thing about kids today, the one thing they understand is this oh, thing right here. Oh, you know it, baby. So, you know it. So we're rather than fight that and, and make it their problem the way they were raised or the way right. they look at the world mm -hmm. just because that's not the world we grew up in it, it it we have to appreciate and understand that's where they're at we're trying to meet people where they're at i don't i don't you know it doesn't matter to me it's like i i just want to give you the information and it's right. like and so we've figured out a way how to distill this thing down to the point where you know, we're calling ourselves the TikTok of training, basically. And so the, the whole idea is that we want to give these these team members the ability to watch someone actually demonstrate and explain something, give them the why, rather than having to keep going to the chef, going to the managers, going to the coworkers, go, hey, how do I do this? How right down to like how to turn on a piece of equipment. I mean, dude, do you know how many people don't even know how to turn on a piece of equipment? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have a client that did a video last month to teach. So he uses those robots that go back and forth in the dining room for busing and, and food running. Sure. He, you know, which is kind of cool. They don't even know how to turn the stupid thing on. <laughs> so it's like he had, to, he had to make a training video just, just so that they would stop asking him how to turn it on. Well, and the so, great thing that the great thing yeah. I think uh, – or the appealing thing to me is that these videos can be consumed anytime. Anytime. Right, right because, in the workflow. Because mm -hmm. you're actually making use of something that I think is a huge trend now and I don't hear more about, which is this idea of micro training. Yes. Call that so exactly get dig in, dig into that a little bit for us. That's right. So micro training is, is very interesting. And so I, I think when I say this, most people are like, yeah, that's totally true. I always knew that, but you just didn't really frame it. Sure. There's a ton of studies out there about this. If you watch short videos of five minutes or less, five or six minutes or less, your retention level is, is very high. It's like 80%. Mm -hmm. If you go read a book or you're sitting at a computer for hours doing training courses or whatever, your retention like drops dramatically, maybe down to like 20%. It's just, mm -hmm. it's, and, and there's tons of studies on this stuff. So the whole, the whole premise of micro training again is short burst of information which is exactly the way people are now when they're on social media and looking at things are getting their information whether it be news you know whatever what how cats want to play i mean whatever they're, whatever they're looking at <laughs> on their phones and devices this is this is how we're getting our information these days 
And so we have to understand that. So as an example, let, let's take first day on the job. Mm -hmm. So we've all had that first day in the job, right? Well, the, the thing that we have lo lost perspective on in this business is what a crazy environment it is to walk in, not knowing food service or, or commercial kitchen and walking into it on day one and realizing like, I don't know shit. I, excuse my French. I don't know anything about this thing. No, no, no. This, we, we, this is we, a foreign I, thing here. And we actually like cursing on this show. We so. like cursing. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's how to grab somebody's attention, right? Yeah, I mean, right. A, a well-placed curse word can snap somebody out exactly. of reverie. And it reminds me of the fact that, you know, they've did is <laughs> the reason that Ted talks are 18 minutes is because they've discovered that that's about the length of human attention. Exactly. Like right. anything after 18 minutes is like, oh, okay, whatever, man. Oh, I, I'm, I'm lost yeah. on the concept now. Right. So this idea of short consumable videos are, right. is fantastic. And so do you partner with say owners and operators or are you partnering with individual, like, is it a mom and pop shop? Is it like, yeah. what are the qualifications for somebody to actually sure. bring in this particular type of uh, educational environment? So, you know, in, in the software world, in the tech world, we're called a, a business to business, a B2B mm -hmm. business. And so uh, pretty much all of our clients are what we call enterprise, which means, you know, they have anywhere between, you know, 25 to 800 locations sure. um, and beyond. And so um, that's where things get really effective for operations is when they're scaling it on a big way. We don't we don't go and, and go try to find, like, as you said, the mom and pops. Mm -hmm. um, we certainly can accommodate the mom and pops. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, we are, you know, think about franchises and chain restaurants. Sure. You need that consistency throughout the country. Supermarkets. Think about, you know, I mean, really anybody. I mean, granted, uh, you know, even a mom and pop has to be consistent and, you know, use preventative maintenance and take care of their That's stuff correct. And, and all that. So I'm not discounting that at all. Um, but. The good news for them, as well as everybody else, is to answer your other questions, we do have an inventory of videos that we've already built with, with what I call the fundamentals, hand washing, Perfect. knife skills, how to clean. We have videos on how to clean everything from the dumpster to the dining room, every surface, how to clean and sanitize. We leave nothing, you know, we, we assume nothing. We assume Perfect. you know nothing. And we create gradient education so that one video builds on the other. So by the time you get to the other end, you've seen the whole thing. And so, again, we're trying to take the mystery out of what it takes. And, and we're also trying to help managers and owners really reinvent on-the-job training in a digital fashion. We're like the modern version of on-the-job training. The difference between traditional on the job training versus what we're doing. Ours is digital. So it's the same message every single time. Right. It's the same nomenclature every single time. Um, it's consistent and it's easy to access, right? right? Simple to use. And now the managers are getting pulled out of their offices or off their tasks to answer the most basic of questions. So it's really important that Again, we understand that people are coming into our, our food service world with zero experience mm -hmm. and sometimes zero life skills. I mean, right. you and I grew up in an environment where our parents, our grandparents, our friends, the jobs you're on, people paid attention. They, they trained us and, we, and that's how we learned mm -hmm. and, and we had that balance of all those things. That's just not the case anymore. Um, and so we have to understand it. I mean, I, I mean, this sounds silly, but we literally have like some life skills type thing videos available too, just because we know that not everybody gets the benefit of learning those things at home or in school anymore. Mm -hmm. So they have to know it for the workplace. They have to know that business casual does not mean coming in to work with a torn t-shirt or torn jeans and, 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 and look like, you know, somebody on the streets. I mean, they, right. they just can't, it's just business. That's just not hospitality. That's just not what, what we've been trying to convey for the last hundred years in the hospitality, but they don't know that. And nobody's there to teach them that. The, the other thing I would say about on the job training is 
How many times have you had on the job training and the trainer literally had a full time job at that moment because they're a server or they're a cook and they're in the weeds or maybe they come in, they're not in a good mood or whatever. So the message is different. Every time that trainer talks to the new mm -hmm. guy, right? Yep. It's a different, it, he might be getting some different, oh, I showed you how to do that. Well, no, you didn't even show me how to turn it on. It's like, yeah. you know, it's like, so it's inconsistent. And, and so unfortunately that that is the case. And so again, we're trying to give people on the job training, uh, you know, like I said, TikTok, the TikTok for training and, and make it real simple. But more importantly, back to the mom and pop example, the ability, we're going to show people how to film your own training videos with your own iPhone. Oh, that's great. And I mean, I'm telling you, and you're going to be able to, we're going to have an authoring tool where you can upload your own videos. So you could have a blended you know, a little bit of sprinkle of pineapple videos. Like there's no mm -hmm. reason for you to have a hand washing video. I already right. have all that stuff. You don't, right. need, you don't need knife skills. I have all that. But what you do as an operator, and now you do your own brand standards. Correct. So now let's make, you know, Adam's lasagna. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe, maybe Pineapple Academy gives you the method of preparation and you learn the techniques of cooking, which is all valid, but mm -hmm. it's not our meatloaf might not be your meatloaf recipe, but our meatloaf recipe, or sorry, video, would certainly show you the method of preparation and what you need to do to set up and, and do it, but it's not Adam's meatloaf. And so right. you would need to shoot your own video and show them, you know, and again, if you do it right, and there's lots of examples on YouTube, and we're gonna have lots of examples, how to do an entire meatloaf in like less than two minutes. I mean, mm -hmm. You don't need to show them how to slice and dice the onions and all that kind of stuff. Right. Guys, there's other videos for that. You just want to show them how to assemble that product with all your mise en place ready to go, mm -hmm. what that station looks like, all the ingredients that are there. You give them the ingredients list and then you have an MOP and then you just demo the MOP and you, and you put it together and show them. And the last little picture is that the product's done and it's on a plate and how to present it. Right. So... 90 seconds, boom. I hear that you're doing a lot of technical videos and I'm just curious at what point um, in this, in this um, kind of building of skills, do you actually, are, are there any videos that uh, attempt to explain or to um, model what hospitality looks like? Great question. Yes. So we, we have some customer service. We have some dining room basics. We have, uh, you know, barista basics. We have a lot of things and it's all, it talks, you know, bartender basics. Again, it's about even, even housekeeping, like, you know, how to present yourself, you know, what is the, what is your company's brand? We're all brand ambassadors, whether we like it or not, or whether mm -hmm. if you work for somebody, guess what? You are a brand ambassador. If yeah. you're a frontline employee, whether you're the, the cleaner in the lobby, or the line cook or the server in the dining room, you represent that brand and that's part of the gig. And so, yes, we touch on that, but we also have other partners that we're working with who are creating even more curriculum around that. Um, we're about to launch a course, um, you know, it's called Heroic Hospitality. It was, it's done by another company, but we're hosting it and we're marketing it and we're gonna be launching that here very shortly. And it's done by a top hospitality consulting group that that's all they do is train people. So in, in whether you're a hotel or retail or restaurants, it's all applicable to you, but it doesn't say, it doesn't mean that you can't shoot your own. It doesn't mean, you know, again, in, in the next, you know, 60 to 90 days with the, with the development that we're working on right now, you're going to be able to have your own blend and you can curate, using your own stuff, third party stuff, pineapple stuff, whatever. And so the whole idea is to make this to a point where it'll feel like a custom program because it's, it's brand specific. And, and, and as a matter of fact, by next year, you're going to be able to put your own logo on the platform. Yeah. And so you could, we could even, you know, image it in your colors, in your logo, mm -hmm. you know, and do you partner with other technology companies? Because I'm thinking of a couple of um, 
full service back of the house solutions mm -hmm. uh specific to um um uh, senior living in hospitals mm -hmm. which they do everything from you know inventory to recipes and da, 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 mm -hmm. da, 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 da. so i'm just curious are you being approached by other um are you approaching other technology companies saying hey this would be a wonderful yes. adjunct to what you're already using so I'll, I'll give you an example like right now that's half we're in the middle of right now uh it's just it's kind of getting off off the ground so one of our senior living community companies is based out of los angeles mm -hmm. and uh they're using our product for training uh matt perez is the head of dining for that that company an amazing operator again hospitality guy came to senior living okay so really you know drinks the kool-aid he gets it yep um, and he's using a digital checklist. And so what we're working on because of this new technology, we're going to be able to have what are called embeddable links. What's unique about what we do versus say embedding a YouTube video or a Vimeo video. Mm -hmm. Number one, our stuff is all in a safe database. Correct. So it is not social media. It will go through firewalls because we're, that's how we built it. I mean, we're in the we're in the you know we're in government facilities we're in hospitals i mean you you have to have really safe technology certainly you know to, to inter interface with them um so so what's going to happen is he is work this operator is going to we're all working in tandem to build a digital checklist experience with embedded videos so i'll go back to that example of it's your day to clean the ice machine boom okay adam gosh and you're like wow i haven't done that in two years good watch and it's right in the digital checklist watch a video on how to how to sanitize the ice right so so i just want to pull back a little bit because we were having this conversation before we got on the show and you mentioned you know that uh that that crummy clipboard that everybody carries around right. got food <laughs> dangling off it yes because you used it as a tray to carry your plate over That's the garbage right. can and, and to get, get your lunch but so we're all used to having um, checklists and, you know, the best operations are the ones that are systematized and right. the chefs that are like the chefs that shun systems because, oh, dude, don't hem me in. Like I need to be right. creative and fly free. It's a bunch of horse shit because at the end of the day, you still need clean bathrooms. That's right. <laughs> and yeah. how do you do that by putting up a checklist, which, you know, will either be adhered to ignored, depending on our ability to follow up on those delegated tasks. Right. And what you're telling me is that there's a company that's actually producing digital checklists yes. that I have on my phone, yes. that not only do I have like, say my opening checklist or my opening critical path, but my closing critical path. And yep. I can actually assign those duties to other people on my yep. team. Yep. You're talking about making people autonomous and accountable and, and, because what, what's the one thing we're so used to hearing? Well, I know I how to time. do it, but he doesn't know how to do it. Right. I mean, how many times have we heard that over the last, you know, me, in my case, 45 years? Right. Um, oh, I know how to do it. So that's why I always do it. Well, you know, guess what? You know, or, I, or no one knows how to do it as good as I can do it. That's the other one, right? <laughs> uh, my, my, and my other favorite one is, well, why are you doing it that way? Well, you know, back in 1949, mm -hmm. Alice used to be the food service director here, and and this is how we do it. And that's the way she well, wanted it done. Right? And that's the way. She, so it never changed. We never even question it. That's the other right. thing. They don't even question it exactly. because they, they don't know. But anyway, the point is, look, we live in a modern age now. It's it's just time to advance everything forward. And if 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 the pandemic taught us nothing else. Technology is really what's going to make things smoother and easier. Granted, there's tech technology phobias out there. There's people not comfortable, maybe older, you know, older adults might not feel as comfortable with, with some of that technology. But at the end of the day, if you got a 16 year old who's coming to work for you uh, in your restaurant or your food service operation, they have no back off on technology. They, I mean, you can get them in those systems and, and, and I just had this conversation with, with a friend of mine yesterday. Uh, her son just started working at a restaurant. And within three days, he's on the POS and he's managing it. No problem. He goes, he goes, yeah, you know, at first I was, and then I got into it. And I realized, oh, I understand how this works. Yeah, because he's thinking in ones and zeros. Yeah, it's like it, he's done it a million times. It's just different applications. But the That's beauty correct. of technology these days, they've all learned how to, give us the same type of widgets or buttons that we all have come accustomed to using. 
And so, so it's easy for them to assimilate into a tech situation, these younger folks. So that's why technology is so important and to the efficiencies. And the other thing is, because things have gotten so much more complicated and so much more expensive, we really need to create that accountability and make sure we're staying on top of things. And, and so what's nice about these, like these digital checklist experiences or you know, Pineapple Academy technology is you get reports and you can see what's getting done, what's not getting done. You know, is Adam following his onboarding checklist? You know, is after seven days, has he met the criteria? Hey, Adam, on day seven, hey, I noticed, you know, you're not quite there yet. You need some help with something. So again, this isn't about ignoring the staff or saying, hey, over to you. It's nothing to do with me anymore. No, Mr. Manager, no, Mr. Chef. You're just as responsible, if not more today. Without a doubt. To train them. But now you've got an amazing tool. And if you have the same questions that are being asked you over and over again, ask yourself, why am I being asked this all the time? Right. Well, gosh, well, maybe my process is not exactly dialed into the point where I don't have to think about this anymore. Exactly, because it used to be that we would blame the person running the, the system, not the system itself. There you and go. So the, the smart operator will pull himself back and remove himself emotionally from the situation and go on. Is it really the person or is it the system that's screwed up? And if it's 100%. the system that's screwed up, how can we actually fix it? Because leaving it up. Okay. So two, two things to jump to mind. Uh, first off, thank you for this conversation. It's incredibly engaging. Number one, I think as much bad as COVID was for our industry and the world, I, sure. I, I think that there are some hidden um, benefits to it. Number one, yeah. prior to COVID, if you asked a chef to jump on a zoom call, he wouldn't know what the hell you were talking about. Right. <laughs> Um, so we were forced as a, as a community and as a fraternity to get pulled into the 21st century to recognize that there are tools that exist out there that are just not a POS system, right? right? POS system used to be our complete focus and where's our sales mix and all this different kind of stuff. Yet there's more information that can be gathered with systems like this. And, um, and it kind of pulled the sheen of respectability off the industry and going like, okay, we lost 6 million jobs. We got about half of those back up until now. Everybody, every major um, hospitality news outlet is talking about, hey, hey, good times are here again. Now we're back to pre-pandemic levels, yet we're still understaffed, which they don't want to talk about. Um, and uh, again, so if we didn't have time back then, we certainly don't have time now, yet we also want to grow our brand and our uh, the opportunity mm -hmm. for um, revenue flow and profit, if only to put that profit back into the uh, business and say, now we want to start offering healthcare or the right. um, uh, PTOs or whatever the hell that is. How about uh, and career development? Can we at least agree that career development, you mentioned a word earlier that I wanted to circle back on apprenticeships. Yep. Look, we have apprenticeship programs in the mm -hmm. sense that we have learning tracks. And, and I actually have customers who now are working with the Department of Labor. Do, do you know that there's monies available for the federal government for chef apprenticeship programs? These are two year programs and you can make you can get reimbursed all your investment, your administrative costs, all that stuff. And suddenly two years later, you got a guy who is certified in I mean, you want to talk about loyalty to a company if you were to do that? I mean, we have to understand that you, and you mentioned this earlier about this for-profit culinary training that happened for mm -hmm. so many years. That really created a dark stain, I think, in many yep. ways, okay? Yep. It created an unrealistic expectation. Yes, sir. For I have interviewed dozens of people coming out of culinary school and I love to interview them. But the one thing I have found with a lot of these culinary grads, you know, they're coming out of school with zero work experience. Correct. I'm sorry, but a culinary school kitchen experience has nothing to do with what happens in the real world. Sorry, folks, to burst your bubble, but if you've never worked in a restaurant or a commercial kitchen and you're coming out of culinary school and you think you're going to snag some job, guess what? You're going to be a line cook for me. Well, you, and it, you, you have nothing to give me except that you, you know how to use a knife and you know the words and you know, the, but you're never been, you've never been tested under fire. Right. And there's no 
they're not equipping these students with the tools that they're going to need later on in their career, such as leadership skills, communication right. skills, relationship building skills, right. uh, those type of things that become absolutely critical to not only your success, but your operation success and the longevity. Sure. But the point I wanted to get to uh, is that coming out of the pandemic, job number one for our industry is to make sure that everybody understands that this is a safe environment for them to come back to, there that this go. is an, that, that this is an honorable position, that it's yes. worth their time and effort, that you can achieve things in this career that you wouldn't any in any other career. You can travel the world. You can experience so many different things. And yet, if we're not the ones that are owning that narrative and putting that out right. there, like, listen, you, you want to understand your career trajectory within your environment. Totally get that. You want to mm -hmm. know where your training materials are. You got that. Here's your job description. Here's your skill set. Here's mm -hmm. your skill tests. You know, the associates that we have now and those that want to come into the industry, they're telling us what, what we should be providing them. And yet many of us are like, we don't Crazy. really give a shit. You know, That's you're right. either on my, you're either on my bus or you're out walking yeah. and they're like, okay. Like they're going to walk out in the middle of a Saturday night and That's never exactly come right. and, and never bat an eye about it. They're not going to feel bad or, or like, whereas probably when I was coming up, I probably had a false sense of loyalty, loyalty to some um, employers where, you know, I would never think about uh, walking out because I always thought that I could change the situation, you know, make it Understood. improve it uh, through my own force of will or personality. And the reality is, is that doesn't really work when it, you have an owner who's just, Right, you know, exactly. And, and that is an incredible message, Adam. And, and I love that you share that because it, it's totally true. It's like kids today are much more astute and more aware of culture and interactions between people. You know, we grew up in a world where you kept your head down, your mouth yep. shut, and you did the work. Yep. And, and I attribute that to the post-World War II management mentality of a yep. top-down management structure. Now, in the military, it works and it has a reason because it keeps people alive. Right. And but, you know, the work world is not about keeping alive. It's about doing a good job and having a, a full life. Right. Right. Uh, and so culture is very important uh, to, to pe up and coming people. And it should have been important to all of us all yeah. along. But it just we just didn't think that way. And and, you yeah. know, shame on us. I mean. So, you know, I, I love this, the attitude, you know, what you're talking about earlier and what we were talking about, how we, we blame the young people on things. Oh, you know, they're too young. I don't want, no, dude, you're just too old or you're just too stubborn or your ego's in the way, or you're not right. listening. You're not paying attention and you're not a lifelong learner. Right. This, this may Big be a distinction. I couldn't agree more. And that lifelong learning is really, uh, a critical realization because I remember leaving high school and thinking, yeah, I'll probably never use math again. Right. <laughs> yeah. Good example. Right. Hey, brilliant. Yeah, right. exactly. And, right. um, and it's only in hindsight that I think, and this is going to be, uh, you know, some folks won't have a reference to this, but a GE, which was one of the largest corporations in the world, had a legendary CEO by the name of Jack Welsh, right. who was right. lionized in the press. Everybody thought that he was the greatest thing since sliced bread because he made a lot of profit and um, and shareholders were really, really happy. However, in looking under the cover, like pulling up the bonnet or the hood of the car to look at the engine, it was a shit show inside because he was kind of like that top down. And if you didn't produce uh, to a certain uh, a certain degree or, or like he had all kinds of weird metrics that he would choose and basically drop off the top, the bottom 25% performing of the entire corporation. And he was outsourcing a bunch of stuff. So there was a bunch of stuff that happened under Jack Welch's reign that I think a lot of business owners thought like, yeah, that's the way to do it. That's right. Right. And it's only yeah. in retrospect that people realize, you know, just what a traumatic experience it was, not only for, not only for the people that worked and then lost their jobs, but also for that corporate culture, because after he left, you know, it was right it was horrible. Enough. And right, so, right, you know, right. he, he didn't end up being so lionized, but I think that's kind mm -hmm. of speaks to where everybody's head was at, uh, in that post-war period of like, yep, you're going to, you're going to do as I say, and not as right. I do. And, um, and as long as the shareholders, okay, the profit at any motive or the profit at any cost motivation to me right. is really what fucked this whole thing up. Well, and there's no doubt about it. And like, look, I mean, 
I, I know we're talking to a lot of people here and, yep. and, and I'm certainly not here to offend anybody right, right, or right. anything, but the fact of the matter is, you know, stockholders, yes, they deserve a return on their investment. They I certainly do. About it. But not at the, ex not at the, uh, the expense of damaging the business with a sour culture where you can't hire people or retain people. And it's not a sustainable model. Correct. We have to understand we're, you know, the, our, our biggest problem I think in business today is we think in quarterly dividends rather than a five year <laughs> plan. And honest to God, Adam, it, I've had, right. it, this has bothered me since I was a young kid. It's just sort of like, I get the investor mentality and I think it's, it's healthy and I think it's good. But if it's at the detriment of the frontline staff and the people that actually make that business and are actually, we talked about brand standards before, or you're a brand ambassador, that frontline employees, every much part of that business as the dude that finances it. Without a doubt. And as a matter of fact, I would argue all day long that that person's even more important than you are, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Investor. Yep. And so I think, I think we just have to get real about, you know, what happens in, in our operations, whether food service or manufacturing. I mean, you know, we can go on and on, but where you have tasks that have to be done on a daily basis, we call that the deskless workforce. Yeah. I love and by the way, designation. did you know, did you know that 80% of the workforce is deskless? Think about that. That's very interesting. So that means you're not walking around with a laptop on you. You're not, you know, it's like your job is to be on your feet and do work or be in that van going to serve, you know, go fix the Maytag dryer at somebody's house or, right. you know, whatever. 80% of the workforce. So we have to address this issue. Uh, we don't have technical high schools anymore or not right. like we used to. I mean, when I was in high school, I did everything from auto mechanics to metal shop to wood shop. A am I good at any of them? No. <laughs> but can I talk about it? Have I done stuff? Am I, you know, am I an uh, electrician? No, I'm not. But do I understand it? Well, sure I do. And guess what? If you run a restaurant or a hotel, guess what's there? All these things that we're talking about, you need to understand. It doesn't mean you have to be expert, but we're not training people. We're not making that information ava readily available. There's such a shortage of deskless workforce, particularly in the trades, whether you want to talk, say chefs, electricians, plumbers, you know, contractors, whatever you want to talk about where you're using your hands and you're in a desk environment. There's such a lack of it because we pivoted so hard to college and we forced or we were under this misconception that the only way to make it in this world is through college. And, and we just know it's just, it's just a fallacy. Now that does not mean negating education. I, I want to be very, very clear about that um, because you could be a 22 year old person in an apprenticeship program as a plumber. And by the time you're 25 years old, you can make a hundred grand a year. Exactly. And correct. that's not even an exaggeration. Yep. So, you know, apprenticeship, train, 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 train. You got to learn, learn, find what you like to do and just stick with it. Well, and, and the all, thing about, the thing about mentorship is also having somebody who's like, who sees the greatness in you before you actually do. That's right. Exactly and will, right. and will continue to push you or challenge you. Yeah. Um, and Greg, I, I know we could probably talk about this for another two sure. and a half hours, uh, but I want to respect your time and say, thank you very much for joining us. And if there's anybody out there that would like to learn more about pineapple express or perhaps get on their mailing list, signing up yeah. for their newsletter, thank you, brother. Yeah. how would they, Sure. Well, oh, first of all, we're not Pineapple Express. I support Pineapple Express, but that's okay. But uh, it's, sorry. It's, it's all good. Pineappleacademy.com. That, that, yeah. that was that that was that neuron in my brain that crossed yeah, I, over from I, movies yeah, to education. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um I'm sorry, say it again. Pineappleacademy.com. Yeah. Pineappleacademy.com. We have a presence on LinkedIn, we have a presence on YouTube, uh, Instagram, uh, or on social media. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of free content. Uh, again, our job is to support and provide education. Uh, we want everybody to be lifelong learners and we want to bring that information to anybody who wants to have it. 
And, um, and it, it, it really is as simple as that. Uh, we're just trying to prepare the workforce uh, so they can do their job and be effective and, and hopefully give them some career uh, advantages over, over, over their coworkers, you know, so that they can, you know, advance and move up. Uh, that's what this is all about. George, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate what you're doing and uh, I look forward to catching up to you soon. All right, my friend. Thank you so much.